Welcome to Voices for Peace and Conservation. Join us in listening to inspiring stories from people who are working to save nature while also promoting peace. From the plains of northern Kenya to international conference rooms in Switzerland. Our guests will help us answer the question, how do we take care of nature and live in peace? My name is Hesta Grunewald and I have worked on peace and conflict issues for many years. I will be your host for this podcast on behalf of four organizations who work on conservation and peace. They are Conservation International, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Peace Nexus Foundation, and the Worldwide Fund for Nature, Germany. Our collective experience has convinced us that we need to work together much more closely as peacebuilding and conservation practitioners. Whether we are researchers, policymakers, or activists, we all have a part to play. But how do we do this? And what lessons can we learn from each other's work? Over the course of the coming episodes, we'll be exploring these questions with our guests. For more information, have a look at the podcast description notes. Voices for Peace and Conservation is produced by Impact with Joy. And now, enjoy the podcast. In today's episode, we'll take a closer look at the links between security and conservation. The IUCN's recent flagship report on conflict and conservation sets out the evidence for how nature and natural resources could be sources of conflict and how conflict in turn could damage nature. These linkages mean that the conservation of nature should be important to those who care about security and peace. And that those working in conflict-affected places, including humanitarian, development, and military actors, have every reason to integrate conservation issues into their work. Our guest today is Sherry Goodman, who is a leading expert on environmental and climate security. Sherry has had a remarkable career in this field, going back to serving as the first U.S. Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security from 1993 to 2001. Currently, she is Senior Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center and Senior Strategist and Advisory Board Member at the Center for Climate and Security. Throughout her career, she has shaped the policy landscape on environmental security in the US and abroad. Sherry, we're so glad to have the opportunity to talk to you today and to hear more about your experience of moving environmental issues up the agenda of the security community. So welcome to the podcast. Pleasure to be here. So Sherry, for those who are not so familiar with this topic, could you start us off by explaining what the terms security and environmental security mean to you? Uh, well, thank you. Yes, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, uh, we are not uh, secure as uh, a people or as a nation uh, without protecting our environment. And we have long known um, in the field of national security and uh, with our armed forces in particular that um, military activities can both affect the environment and the environment affects military operations. Uh, For example, you always want to have the best weather forecast uh, and understand climate and environmental conditions when you're about to conduct a military operation. At the same time, historically, military activities have done, uh, you know, caused pollution and done bad things environmentally. Uh, And yet also at the same time, um, military bases themselves can become islands of nature and conservation. In the United States, um, the Department of Defense is the second largest federal landholder, and many many military bases are home to endangered ecosystems and endangered species that are found uh, in very few other places uh, in the country. So over the decades, um, there has been a growing tradition uh, of conservation Um, respect and protection uh, within our armed forces that informs our thinking about environmental security 
and its conservation roots. Great. So you really see those connections between nature and conservation and, and the security sector. And you frequently mentioned this idea of environmental security 2.0. So what would you say are the key components of this concept and how does this help to address gaps in the current thinking that, that on the policy agenda? Well, let me start then by uh, defining environmental security 1.0. Uh, as you noted, I served as the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security uh, in the 1990s, in the early post-Cold War period. And at that time, um, we were focused um, very um, intensively on cleaning up the legacy of past pollution, whether it was from military bases in the United States or at the time uh, helping Russia uh, build down and reduce uh, nuclear waste streams from missiles and submarines, and uh, also clean up military bases around the world, working with militaries uh, in many, many countries. And we call that in part uh, preventive defense, preventive defense. And uh, we were engaged heavily with stakeholders, um, especially in the United States, uh, in engaging communities in decision making. In environmental security 2.0, um, we we focus that now on today's needs, which are informed a lot by the changing climate, uh, of course, and the need to address climate change as an urgent threat multiplier and existential risk, uh, and also hum the human security element of it. Uh, the need to build healthy communities and the recognition uh, that inclusiveness, uh, diversity, understanding the connections between health and environment um, are all foundational elements uh, of building uh, an environmental security that is focused on environmental peace building, uh, focused towards build the positive aspects of developing environmental peace, not only preventing conflict, but building peace with environmental concerns at the core. And, and that really um, echoes also some of the findings of this um, IUCN flagship report, because they really talk about how investing in conservation and restoration of nature and natural resources can contribute to preventing conflict and, and building peace. So in your work, uh, in all these years in the security arena, why do people think that nature matters to the security world? Well, first, but let's talk about the most basic elements. You know, we, we, live at, we live in nature and, you know, most of the members of our armed forces, uh, soldier, sailor, airmen, Marines, and um, civilian national security professionals love, revere, and respect the natural world. Um, I think that's a, a proposition not often well understood by people who don't work in the armed forces, but because somehow it's associated with war. But usually, the, not only is the military the last one who wants to go to war, but also there's deep reverence and respect for the natural world. And I think in this era, we find that even more true because no longer um, do young people take the natural world for granted. I mean, the, the society's most ardent climate activists today are the youth, okay? And that includes the youth across all societies at all levels. And um, so that is, that's a sort of foundational element of it. Um, uh, you know, next it's because we want to leave the world a better place than we found it. And, and that's in many ways what motivates uh, people in the security world, which is to reduce sources of instability. Okay. That's how we talk about it. We talk about reducing sources of instability, whether it's um, China or Russia that are causing disruptive instability uh, at a global governance level, or now today we realize that humans' disruption of the natural world, whether it's in climate change or biodiversity loss, uh, also are sources of instability. And so we need to, to sort of integrate this thinking 
Uh, and that's why I often talk about the convergence, the convergence between environment, environmental security and natural and national security. That's emerged now into this new field of natural or ecological security and understanding how they are all linked together. And uh, and how just building on from that, because um, it raises this question about how do we create high level policies that really bring these things together? So where do these policies sit that you've just referred to the sort of integrated ecological security policies and how do they engage with conservation and security communities or, or how does that come together? Well, increasingly, we see awareness of climate change and uh, increasingly natural security integrated into national security and foreign policy making at the highest levels. So um, in the new uh, Biden administration in the United States, uh, as your listeners probably know, uh, climate change is at the top of the agenda. Uh, the president rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement on day one. Um, within the first week, he issued a major executive order on climate change that integrates it across all of national security and foreign policy, uh, called for the first uh, national intelligence estimate on climate change. And there's ju- and just last week on Earth Day held um, a global a leader summit on climate change with leaders from all around the world. So, uh, and, and we see that reflected, I think, in many other countries now as well. Um, I work with the with national security professionals in many other countries, and there many of them now have integrated climate change and ecological security concerns across um, their planning processes. We also have. Um, created two years ago an International Military Council on Climate and Security, International Military Council on Climate and Security, which I co-lead with uh, the former Judge Chief of Defense, Tom Mittendorp. Uh, And he and I bring together um, military and leaders and national security professionals from over 30 countries now um, that are dedicated to addressing uh, climate considerations in national security policy. Mm. So, I mean, it's it's a it's a very interesting um, point that you've reached really with this agenda. And uh, one of the things that has come up in our podcast series is that a lot of people working on conservation want governments to take more action on conservation issues as well as climate issues. And so, I was wondering from from your experience in this whole policy sphere, clearly the issue of climate change has made it to the top of so many important agendas. Uh, What tips would you have or what lessons can be learned for conservation actors who are trying to do the same for conservation, who are really trying to get the same level of attention for conservation issues? Yes, that's a great question because I I think the the conservation ecological security issues are now where uh, climate issues were a decade ago, which is they are growing in awareness and attention they're perhaps not yet quite at the top of the agenda, but they're coming up there. So um, uh, I, I think that the elements um, that uh, help build uh, increased public uh, and governmental support for this agenda, one is kind of general public awareness and education. So I think the youth and activist voices here are very important. Uh, that's one. I think the storytelling at the highest levels about, you know, the impacts, um, you know, it, it, the fact that uh, climate change, for example, used to be seen as something happening in the future um, that was going to be bad, but wasn't affecting us necessarily right now. But in the last five years, you've just seen extreme weather events, drought, wildfires, uh, floods, you know, in, in most countries around the world. So it's become the urgency of now. Um, I think that we're beginning to realize some of the same with uh, conservation in the sense that um, some species are right at the tipping points. Um, Some um, ecosystems, uh, fisheries, uh, forests um, are also in some places right at the tipping points um, with overfishing and increasing deforestation. 
Uh, then I think, you know, another very important connection is that between wildlife and uh, pandemics and COVID-19 and understanding that connection, I think is going to be also um, increasingly important. And then finally, I'll say, and, and this is where I think um, uh, a lot more um, understanding and awareness is going to emerge in the next year or two, is um, the connections between um, food and water insecurity uh, and growing global migration. And that is, of course, deeply connected to conservation of the natural resources, whether we're talking about Central America or uh, the Sahel and Africa or parts of Asia, uh, where you've got uh, whole regions that have uh, become less agriculturally pr productive and more subject to drought. Uh, that means that they can't support the traditional populations combined with political instability that has led to mass global migration. Uh, so I think that also helps put this uh, matter of conservation much higher on the agenda. Yeah, exactly. And I'm glad that you mentioned COVID. I was going to ask you about that because um, it, I think it's increasingly accepted that COVID, clearly COVID-19 has its origins in nature and the risk of new pandemics remains present, especially since human encroachment on sensitive ecosystems continues. So it, as we, we're not quite out of the woods yet with, with COVID, but as we're starting to think about recovery policies and, and ways to get out of this, do you think it's important that countries prioritize investment in nature-based solutions, so in, in restoring and conserving natural resources as part of the recovery out of this pandemic? Absolutely. I mean, natural um, uh, natural systems and natural-based solutions are important, uh, not only for the COVID recovery, but also as a way of looking at climate solutions, uh, natural system solutions are essential. And especially now that we see ecosystem services uh, from coastal areas with mangroves or coral reefs, and so many critical ecosystems globally are degrading. And um, that, when you just say it like that, you don't know what the specific impacts are. But when you think about the fact that um, many of our coral reefs uh, won't be vibrant or um, well-maintained ecosystems from Australia to the Caribbean uh, within the next decade. Um, and that's not only a loss of, of tourism, but that's a loss of livelihoods uh, for so many millions of people. Um, we have to understand what that, you know, what that means. And, and the second aspect is, you know, environmental crime, which is increasing, also amplifies ecological stress and social instability. Uh, and that's, a, you know, another way to look at it, which is the criminal acts against nature, whether it's wildlife trafficking or illegal timber harvesting or illegal fishing, uh, that also is having uh, devastating consequences. Yeah, and I think also there were some reports during this whole COVID time that the lockdowns uh, has meant that there's less monitoring of some of these sensitive areas and some of the protected species because people were not able to get to those areas. So there's a whole reinforcing cycle there in a way as well. Absolutely. And so we have to be able to think about what's a sustainable use of the resource. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so in your work within the US government and, and also internationally, what were some of the some of the objections, let's say, that came back from people who did not want to tackle this agenda? Where do you think some of the obstacles lie for governments to take conservation and, and climate issues more seriously as part of their security and peace building thinking? Well, sometimes the argument is made that this is mission creep, you know, that uh, essentially we're, you know, uh, um, our, our mission is to um, address either great power competition or terrorist threats. And um, there are other parts of uh, society that need to address conservation issues uh, and that it's more about getting rid of instability than promoting uh, peace or sustainability. Uh, but that's, I think, where the paradigm shift is occurring now, um, which is that it's not enough just to um, uh, eliminate 
uh, the sources of instability. We have to work harder to develop positive sources of um, peace building that includes uh, natural system conservation. And that's not, the solutions in this sense are not primarily for the armed forces by any means. Uh, the solutions come in the civilian sectors of society, um, both in both at the governmental, non-governmental, and private sector level. Um, that said, uh, I think there's growing awareness among security forces that uh, sometimes they have a lot of um, technical expertise. You know, in the U.S. military, we have lots of biologists and natural resource ecologists. And now we have an increasing cadre of climate experts because we have to understand um, how the military operates in and within uh, the natural environment. And that expertise then can be used uh, for constructive, positive purposes as we rebuild our relationships um, with allies and partners. And then let's not forget the sort of logistical capability that's always necessary uh, in the event of natural disasters, you know, we, we speak of the military being kind of the 911 force to back up the civilian first responders. And, and so this, you know, this picture that you, that you're um, painting for us in terms of this collaboration and increase bringing every, everyone's expertise to the table. How can we use this, this moment also now of the shift in paradigm that you've mentioned and potential eventual recovery from, from the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we use this moment to increase dialogue between these different actors, for whether they are from the security sector or the humanitarian sector or, or the business sector? Well, um, you know, just as we have done uh, in, in recent months and years to create the momentum to address climate change by bringing together various sectors of society to address the climate crisis, I think we also need to think about the convergence in disciplines to address the ecological security crisis that we are fast approaching. And so that means all sectors of society and all a uh, range of disciplines, uh, you know, from economics to natural resource conservation um, to understanding social sciences and physical sciences uh, to uh, national security and natural security. I think back to a story of, of when in the 1990s when I was uh, working uh, with the with the army, and I recall an army general who was responding to an earthquake in Haiti, um, and he said, "You know, I was." He said, "Sherry, you know, I was trained to go to war with the 82nd Airborne on my right and the 101st on my left." He said, "But I went into Haiti um, to help alleviate the suffering from a devastating earthquake with um, the U.S. Agency for International Development on my right and the Red Cross on my left." And that became the paradigm for modern relief missions in the last several decades. I think increasingly we may see a model where um, when you have uh, the military is flagged both by a conservation or natural resource NGO and a natural resource agency uh, on either side. And that's how we're going to conduct environmental peace building. Uh, in some of these most critical regions. And when you think about examples of recent peace, global peace agreements, and Colombia is the one that comes um, most particularly to mind, which had an element of environmental peace building as a core component uh, of that peace agreement between uh, the Colombian government and the FARC rebels. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good one to mention. We've actually talked about that in other episodes in this series. So it's a it's a great note to end on. So, um, so Sherry, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your experience with us. Clearly, there are opportunities to really push conservation issues more centrally onto the policy agenda following in, in the footsteps of the work that you've done on, on climate, the work that you and others have done on that, and also to strengthen a multi-stakeholder focus on, on peace that really includes environmental concerns. So really bringing all those threads together. Thank you very much for that. And thanks for your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to join you. This episode's content was provided by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. 
The IUCN is a membership union uniquely composed of more than 1,400 government and civil society organizations and more than 18,000 experts contributing through the six IUCN commissions. The broad membership and wealth of expertise make the IUCN the global authority on the status of the natural world and the measures needed to safeguard it. It implements conservation projects that combine the latest science with the traditional knowledge of local communities in order to reverse habitat loss, restore ecosystems, and improve people's well-being. For more information about the IUCN and its flagship report on conflict and conservation, have a look at their website on www.iucn.org. Join me in the next episode where we will conclude our podcast series by discussing where should we put our time and efforts going forward on the environmental peacebuilding agenda. Be sure to sign up or follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any other platform where you usually enjoy your podcasts. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day and see you next time.